I'm Bumia Kinesotu. I'm the Deputy Director of the Rangel Program at Howard University. Um, what I'm going to do is share just a quick overview of the uh, Rangel and Pickering Fellowships. If you've attended the sessions in the past or you've been reading our website um, ferociously, then a lot of the, a lot of the information is not is not new to you. Um, if this is your first time here, welcome. I encourage you to take a look at our YouTube page and our website and our social media, all the things, our, come to our office hours uh, to learn much more about the program if I cover something that you wanted to learn more about. We will have time at the end for questions once our uh, fellows have a chance to share their experiences. Uh, so first, let me just share my screen for you all just to go through the Wrangle and Pickering programs for you, if you would give me just a second. I'm just going to actually stop sharing and pull up the right slides here. Uh, let's see, I'm going to pick on Zerlina because that's who I see. Can y'all see my slides? Okay, <laughs> perfect. All right, so uh, just a quick overview about uh, the Wrangell and Pickering, right? These two graduate fellowship pro are, programs are uh, funded by the Department of State uh, with the mission of promoting excellence and diversity um, in the State Department. So uh, the First part of our fellowship awards, and all of this applies to both the Wrangell and to the Pickering. Uh, they're the same exact program, and I'll talk about their differences in just a second. So you get uh, up to forty-two, four, up to eighty-four thousand dollars over two years to cover uh, graduate school. Um, that includes uh, $24,000 a year for your tuition that goes directly to the school and other mandatory fees, as well as $18,000 living stipend uh, that you use during the academic year. On top of your uh, living stipend while you're in graduate school, we also provide up to $11,000 to cover your overseas internship and your congressional internships. Now, some people or some organizations, some schools uh, do provide uh, supplemental financial assistance. And some of our fellows can talk just about how they sought financial support while they were in grad school as a fellow. Um, some worked, some didn't, some um, were able to get merit awards and things like that. So uh, we were, we're gonna talk more uh, about that. But in essence, um, each fellow gets around $42,000 per year, which, which equals about $84,000 over the two years. Um, as a Wrangell um, or Pickering Fellow, you do have some obligations. Uh, you do have to make sure you uh, pass clearance or get through your clearance, your medical security and su suitability clearance. Um, while you're in graduate school, you do have to maintain a G point, GPA of a 3.2 each semester. There are other service uh, entry, foreign service entry requirements um, that come up and our fellows I'm sure can share what those are. There's a lot more, but uh, including the FSOT and FSOA um, for our fellowships, you are uh, required to take the FSO, um, FSOT, the test, the written test. You don't necessarily have to pass it, uh, but you do have to take it. Uh, and then you are required to take the FSOA and pass it, um, and you have up to five years to do so. Uh, and you have to, so the five years is the service obligation that every fellow um, commits to once they're accepted to um, our, our fellowship. So to be eligible, basic stuff, you have to be a US citizen to apply for our fellowships. Uh, the 3.2 is our magic number. So you need to have a 3.2 cumulative GPA for your undergrad degree. Um, and then you have to be planning to enroll in a two year master's program in the fall of 2022. So that is next fall. Uh, so we'll talk more about what those two year master's degrees um, programs, what counts is that. Um, and our fellows will talk a little bit more about, again, uh, how they came to choose their grad school program and that two year program and some of the coursework that they enrolled in while they were uh, students. So uh, 
the Pickering and the Wrangell um, Fellowship do have two different timelines um, and two separate, um, uh, I would say, selections processes, although the application is exactly the same. So first, uh, you know, the Pickering application will close um, on September the 22nd, which is just in a couple of weeks. Uh, they will select their 90 finalists on October 29th. Um, the selections process, which includes an interview and a writing assessment, will take place from November 15th and the 19th. Uh, we'll select 45 fellows um, November the 19th. Uh, and then we'll prepare those 45 individuals for what is the next two years, which is first orientation in DC. Uh, they'll go to graduate school. After graduate school, their first year of graduate school, they'll do their domestic internship at the Department of State in 2023. They'll go to the second year of graduate school, do their overseas internship uh, in the summer of 2024. And then immediately after the overseas internship, that fellow or those fellows will enter into uh, A100. For Wrangell, uh, it's slightly different, um, but not by much. So our deadline is a week after Pickering's. So hopefully you all plan to apply to both. Um, we'll do our 90 finalists on November 4th. We'll select uh, the, um, the selections process. So the interview and the writing assessment will take place November 30th through December 2nd. You'll know by the 3rd if you were selected as one of the 45 fellows. Orientation will start next May. And then here's where the two differ, right? So Wrangell will do their, what's the domestic internship, which for Wrangell is a congressional internship that happens the same summer as orientation right before you start graduate school. Uh, the overseas internships take place after the summer after your first year of graduate school, uh, and then you go to graduate school for your second year, and then you join the Foreign Service right after you graduate, which um, Zerlina um, and Gabriel um, did the, just this uh, past summer. So um, we're really excited about um, you know the upcoming cohort and looking forward to meeting some fresh new fresh new faces that are going to become like future diplomats, which is great. All right, almost done here. Uh, so a little bit about the grad school process before we um, talk with um, our fellows. So um, again, we do only fund two year master's programs. Now we do do dual, uh, so long as they meet the mission of the Department of State and don't have you out there for more than two years. So if you are interested in doing, for example, um, shout out to SEPA, that's where I went. If you went to, if you are, or thinking about SIPA, they've got a program um, where you could do one year uh, MBA program, one year um, a public uh, administration or IR degree. That's totally fine because you can complete it in two years. Now, if you wanted to do a JD um, and the public administration degree, that would not work with our program. One, because we don't fund JDs. Uh, and two, it would take you over the two year mark. So if you're interested in uh, issue areas or degree programs that are longer than two years and not necessarily part of the mission of the State Department, uh, this may not be the fit for you um, at, this, at this go around. But having said that, um, the degree areas that we fund are vast. Uh, what's not on here is data analytics. Um, we do MBA programs. Uh, we would consider social work programs if they have a global component to it. Right. Uh, so if you're thinking of doing something that doesn't fall neatly into one of these categories, uh, you know, ask yourself if it has a global note, look at the curriculum to make sure it's got a global component to it. Um, we at the Wrangell program and Pickering before uh, you're selected as a fellow, we cannot approve your graduate school program. Once you're selected as a fellow, though, we promise to wrap you in the arms of our director, Patricia Scroggs and Lily Lopez McGee and Michael VC and the community of folks at Wrangell uh, to help you, you know, think through the right program that's a fit for you. Uh, it has to be a US based institution. So your degree has to be coming from an American school. Um, you have to be there full time and in person, maintain that 3.2 GPA. Um, I know a lot of schools with COVID have um, started to come back, but before many schools went online, uh, those are slightly different. If the school um, is typically traditionally virtual, uh, we wouldn't fund it, um, but obviously with the way things are going in the world um, with COVID, understanding if a school is in person normally and they have to switch over to virtual, that's, that's fine. 
Um, as I mentioned, there's some additional graduate school um, support that comes. We have our grad school partner list on our website. If you haven't seen it, you should check it out. Uh, we list out uh, the schools who have um, decided to offer additional support. If you're selected as a fellow, we don't include the details. You can always email Wrangle or Pickering um, inbox to get that list of grad school partners. And here's where I think a lot of folks who are new to the program get confused. Uh, so you will apply to graduate school separately from the application process. So uh, one, getting into the fellowship does not automatically uh, get you into graduate school or any graduate school for that matter. Uh, what happens is you meet our deadline, you submit all your materials, um, you're selected as a finalist, hopefully. Um, and then you move on to the process. At the same time, you're also applying to graduate schools and looking to meet the requirements of all of that grad school's um, admissions, all of their re admissions requirements. Um, it helps if you're a Rangel Fellow and that schools like Many schools are familiar. Um, many of the schools that are in the public policy IR space are familiar with the Wrangell and Pickering. Um, so they may, uh, so like you're not totally, you know, brand new uh, and they're familiar with our funding and, and all of that. Um, but if you're going to a school that's not, um, it is incumbent on you to orient the school to the fellowship and really dig in deep to understand how that curriculum is going to meet uh, your needs as a student and certainly as an FSO. All right, so you're done with grad school and then you become like our wonderful panelists and you become diplomats um, at the Department of State, assuming you meet all of the requirements related to security clearance, um, FSOT and, and so on and so forth. And as Patricia would say, you go on to make uh, a difference in the world through a rewarding career um, all around the globe. All right, finally, again, I won't uh, uh, dwell on this, but we have all of these elements of the application. Hopefully uh, you all have got your application started, at least um, getting all of particularly your student aid report, got your FAFSA done, uh, so on and so forth, so that uh, you meet the deadlines for both programs. All right, and then there is our contact information. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I could just do a quick introduction for our um, discussion this evening. So first I have, he was on, here he is, uh, Heiner Sibrian. Hey Heiner, Heiner is a 2018 Pickering Fellow um, joining us and he's going to talk about his experience. We have Zerlina Bartholomew, where is she? There she is. She's a 2019 Wrangell Fellow. Uh, she went to Syracuse, Syracuse. Heiner went to uh, Harvard. Uh, we have Isabella Green. The squares like they've kind of like moved where is she there she is <laughs> Isabella Green is a 2018 uh, Pickering Fellow and she went to American University here in Washington DC we have Erica Lewis, Lewis uh, where there she is a 2007 Wrangell Fellow so we have some seniority here she went to Pepperdine on the west coast uh, she's also an HU grad I, I cannot like go by without saying that you know we have HU in the building uh, and then we have Gabe Cortez Gabe is a, uh, 19, a 2019 Wrangell Fellow uh, who went to UT Austin. So um, I'm going to just get started and we'll first have each fellow. Um, let's start with you, Gabe. Um, just give us a quick overview of who you are um, an introduction of who you are, uh, where you went to grad school, uh, your focus area. Uh, your cone that you are uh, in. I know you're new, uh, but your cone. And then tell us a little bit about um, what brought you to wanting to become a diplomat. And I'm going to ask each of our panelists to keep their remarks fairly short so we can get through the discussion and onto Q&A. So Gabe, go for it. Yeah, sounds good. First of all, can you hear me? Because it just told me my connection is unstable. <laughs> yeah, well, you sound great. I can hear you. Okay, perfect, perfect. All right. Um, so, hey, everybody. My name is uh, Gabriel Cortez. I, um, uh, as Bumi said, I'm a 2019 Wrangell Fellow. Uh, uh, so, I went to the LBJ School at uh, uh, UT Austin, the LBJ School of Public Affairs. 
Um, there I studied my degree, um, you know, studied the typical here in the department has been uh, national security. So I'm a political officer um, and I'm really focused on uh, Europe as a region, um, West Europe, Central Europe, Eastern Europe. Um, I have kind of professional experience all around. So really interested in the area um, and then on political military affairs, especially um, considering like NATO and the black stuff to work on. But the foreign service, um, for me, it was, or Boomi, do you want, do you want me to get into that now or do you want me to hold that? Okay. You, you um, can get into it now, yeah. Okay, sure, sure. Um, so for me, I actually did a State Department internship um, when I was in uh, undergrad. I interned uh, uh, with the Foreign Service in Milan um, with the U.S. Uh, General or the Consulate General there. And service was before that, and uh, so to be able to go and see what the Foreign Service was like through this internship was was incredible. Um, so that really put me on the path forward. And then I became a uh, Peace Corps uh, volunteer. I served in Ukraine for three years, and it was there in Ukraine that I was like, well, what am I going to do after Peace Corps? And I uh, I somehow discovered the fellowship. So I don't even know how, because even in Milan, I didn't learn about the fellowships. It wasn't until I was in Peace Corps many years later that I discovered uh, the Wrangell and the Pickering Fellowship. So I thought I would apply and I'm super excited to be here. And it's been an amazing journey ever since. Um, and then uh, just in terms of why I picked LBJ and why I'm a huge advocate for UT Austin, um, it's a great school. Um, it doesn't get the attention that um, some of the schools on the East Coast get, but it's a phenomenal school. Um, their global policy program has only been for about 11 years. So the, the school has been around for 50 years, but the, the global policy program has only been around for like 10, 11 years. So it's still a newer program, but at, you know, at this point, it's already top 10 in the country for policy. It's got amazing professors and, and faculty. Courses are great. Um, Austin itself is just an amazing city to spend two years in. There's just so much going on. Uh, unfortunately, you know, COVID kind of cut into that a little bit, uh, I'm canceling cool things, an amazing opportunity and amazing experience. And Great. Thank you so much, Gabe. And you, you were a little choppy. Um, I'm not sure um, if it was just me or others caught some of that yeah so you were a little choppy um, but we caught most of what you what you said um, let's see why don't we jump to Heiner Heiner why don't you tell us a little bit about you um, your cone and what brought you to the Foreign Service yeah thanks Bumi um, so uh, Gabe's a man after my own heart uh, we have a lot of this, uh, similar interests um, I uh, I graduated from uh, the JF, uh, JFK school, the Harvard Kennedy School, um, back in 2020. Um, so I spent one year in, in COVID distance courses um, and uh, did a, uh, uh, actually had a lot of work experience um, from my undergrad to my graduate, um, which uh, I graduated from Georgia State University uh, in 2013. Uh, so about, you know, um, about six years. Um, and some of that I spent working at the State Department as a contractor, actually in the same office as Erica Lewis um, when she was there, um, managing grants in Israel, West Bank, Gaza, and the Iranian Peninsula. Um, I have a Middle Eastern studies background, uh, learned Arabic through a born scholarship at the American University in Cairo. And ultimately what drew me to international studies just generally um, was uh, my father's experience in the Salvadorian Civil War as a child. Um, he came over when he was quite young, um, uh, doing, you know, hopping on top of trains uh, the way that uh, many undocumented migrants do now, and, um, and learning about uh, the history of the Salvadorian Civil War, and then the U.S. Uh, role in that conflict, um, in, in good ways and in bad, uh, was something that was uh, very compelling to me, uh, something that I uh, wanted to look a little bit deeper into, and then, you know, living in a post 9-11 war um, and looking at the way that the US policy was being managed in the Middle East, I thought that there was maybe something I could do, uh, you know, some, some lessons to be learned and uh, some ways to implement that. 
you know, jury's still out whether I'll actually have that sort of impact. <laughs> uh, I'm currently in my first tour here in uh, Lome, Togo, uh, which is a small country in West Africa, where I'm the pole mill officer and the human rights officer here. Um, and uh, and it's it's been a little less than a month and it's been pretty great uh, in a lot of ways. Um, so I'd be more than happy to talk about that. While I was in grad school, uh, I studied national security um, and I also studied uh, international negotiations and uh, actually political philosophy. Um, the Carver Kennedy School, you know, like the LBJ School, is a public policy program. So it's not, you know, it's international and global affairs is our concentration, um, but there's a lot of leeway there. And that's where I'll stop. Thank you so much, Hannah. Such an interesting background, um, all of you actually. Uh, Zerlina, want to go next? Sure. Um, well, first, thank you for inviting me, and it's a pleasure to meet you all, albeit virtually. Um, so I'm Zerlina Bartholomew, and I graduated. It feels like so far away, but it was only maybe three months ago. But I graduated from the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University, upstate New York. Um, go Orange, if anyone is an upstate New York um, resident. I got, I received two master's degrees, so it is possible to get two master's uh, with your fellowship. Um, one is in public administration and the other was in international relations. Um, and my focus was on uh, not a region, but more so theme. So it was on peace, security and conflict for one of my master's degrees and the other was administration, which has elements of economics and <clears throat> management and like budget. And so <clears throat> that was, it was an incredible experience. I could talk about Syracuse all day. It's the, it has, it's the oldest public administration program in the United States and is, if I may, the number one program in public affairs. I'm not boasting, it's just facts, but all of these schools are uh, fantastic. Um, and then my cone of interest is uh, public diplomacy but I will be doing my first tour in consular affairs um, in Haiti. And then uh, I feel like I'm forgetting something, Boomi. I swear I had it together. But yeah, um, that's, oh, why your was con. I in the Foreign Service? And your um, con. Yes, public diplomacy um, is my cone. Um, so in terms of why I entered the Foreign Service, I would say, I can, there are a number of reasons, but one in particular was I was able to do a Fulbright research grant in Morocco after I graduated from undergrad in 2015. And so while I was in Morocco, I was able to interact <clears throat> with the embassy and the consulate there. And so uh, they had a public affairs program. I think it was a Martin Luther King Jr. event slash Black History Month event. And while, and they invited Fulbright and PCV or Peace Corps volunteers to attend. And so uh, in that opportunity, in that experience, I was I got firsthand exposure to some of the work that not just foreign service officers, but PD, public diplomacy, public affairs officers do specifically. And I found it really, um, really inspiring for lack of a better term and something that interested me. I had not really known a lot about diplomacy. I've I've always liked the idea, but it was all, always kind of like this nebulous, oh, what does it actually mean uh, sort of thinking, but being able to see it firsthand really got me excited. Um, and then when I came back to the US, I ended up in a young professional working group. And while there I met a fellow and she recommended that I look into Wrangell and Pickering. And here we are today. This was back in 2017. And so now four years later, it's become a reality. So I don't want to take up too much time because I know there are a lot of questions, but, um, you know, er things are possible. You know, it's when they say have a three to five year plan, three to five years passes by very quickly. I didn't know that, you know, back in 2018, when I applied that I'll be going to Syracuse and then getting two master's degrees. And then now here I am um, with a country on my profile. So um, I'm, I'm very excited to share any more, any more insight and I'll end my comments there, over. Thank you, Selena. We'll go with Erica and then uh, Isabella. 
Hello, everyone. Again, thank you for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here today. Um, my name is Erica Lewis, and for graduate school, I attended Pepperdine University in Malibu, California. Hopefully that gives an indication as to why it's a great place to consider. Malibu is a great place to live. It's beautiful. Um, but one of the reasons I chose Pepperdine was because I was very interested in attending a smaller program. And also, many people may not know that, um, know this, but Pepperdine is actually a Christian school. And so I was very curious to kind of get a feel for what public policy program might be like, uh, looking, looking at some courses where you could also specialize and take things such as religion and public policy. Um, just given the impact that it has in the United States. And they also had a lot of California local focus courses. And um, most of my career, I've kind of looked at local and global at the same time. Um, so I, it was a great program. I loved it. It was a very small program as well. Um, and so I, I definitely encourage folks to consider it. Uh, right now, I'm serving as political economic chief. I'm in Masera Lesotho. I'm an economic honed officer. And um, I chose to enter the foreign service uh, from the time I was in high school. I did model United Nations. I knew this was something I was interested in. Um, so when I was choosing undergrad programs, I chose to focus on international business and African studies actually at Howard. Um, and here I am in Africa now. So this was very much a dream job for me. So I chose in undergrad to apply for a State Department internship just to make sure that, you know, I kind of cemented my decision to pursue this route. Uh, so I did an internship just through the general process in Sierra Leone when I was an undergrad um, and ultimately decided to apply to both fellowships when it was time to um, decide whether I wanted to go to graduate school or kind of keep going this business route being an international business major at Howard. Um, and so another reason why Pepperdine really stuck out amongst the schools that I chose to apply for, which may not be as relevant today, um, is the funding. I did receive some money from the school directly, uh, which was a great addition. And I see that um, in the outline that Boomi went through, the amount of funding that the fellowship provides actually has gone up some um, since I was in, in, the, in the program more than 12 years ago. Um, so Pepperdine was providing enough uh, additional funding on top of what the fellowship was providing, the, the stipend and then the direct support um, so that I didn't have to pay anything out of pocket. So again, that may be a consideration depending on which school you go to, I'm sure some schools still might be more than kind of that $50,000 threshold. So just another thing to consider um, as well to try to look for those opportunities for merit um, scholarships if available. Thank you, Erica. Great, another uh, great perspective here on going to a Christian school um, as part of your grad school experience. And then last but not least, Isabella. Oh, hi. Hello, everyone. It is so nice to meet you. My name is Isabella, and I am an incoming management officer. And I studied at the American University School of International Service. Like uh, Zerlina, I just graduated in May, and it seems like it was such a long time ago. Um, I focused on foreign policy and security issues in the Asia Pacific and Latin America. And with my program, I had a lot of flexibility. It's known as the Comparative and Regional Studies Program within SIS. And so I was allowed to ex explore a myriad of issues in both regions, which was something that was very unique. Um, I found in researching graduate school programs because most graduate school programs will allow you to focus on one region or one specific country, but not necessarily um, two. The other um, thing that I liked about my program is that I had the flexibility to move around um, um, class re course requirements to fulfill um, specific areas because with my particular program, it had a regional request of secondary region, primary region, as well as uh, something called a thematic focus. And so I, I got a lot of flexibility um, in um, within this program. Another element that attracted me to it was the funding aspect. With SIS, I received full funding, and then there were also some other amenities as well that were um, included, which you can find out more information about that. If you're interested in SIS, you can um, reach out to, um, uh, to the contact person and they can uh, give you more um, information in regards to um, how, what that looks like. Um, 
as far as what brought me to the fellowship, um, at the time I learned about the Wrangle and Pickering programs in 2014, I was um, hosting a cross-cultural event for my in my undergraduate institution, which is Western Kentucky University. It's a public institution in uh, Bowling Green, Kentucky. And I met, I invited the diplomat in residence at the time and um, invited him to speak about, um, about his career and about opportunities um, with, within the State Department. And after the event, um, he invited me to another um, um, event a week later and told me uh, about the Foreign Service and said, you should really look into Wrangle and Pickering programs. And then from there, um, I, I studied abroad in China and finished up my last year at Western Kentucky. And then from there, I applied um, beginning in 2016. And it did take me a few times to uh, to receive um, uh, to receive the Pickering Fellowship. But persistence is where it's just, you know, persistence and keep, you know, keep going. And like Zer Zerlina, those five year plans, they do they do wind up they do wind up quick. But I would have never imagined, you know, in 2014 um, when I had the idea for this cultural event at my university that it would take me to where I am today. Like I, I was, uh, e even now I look at it and I reflect on it and I'm just amazed. So it just shows you, you know, what can happen when, you know, when you keep pushing, you know, keep pushing forward. And of course, you know, have a, a vision for what you'd like to do. Awesome. Thank you so much, Isabella. All right, well, we I had all these questions I was gonna ask, ask each one of our panelists, um, but for the sake of time, I'm gonna switch it up. One of the things you learn is being um, a diplomat just a mature adult, uh, is flexibility. <laughs> and so uh, I had all my list of questions, but I'm sure uh, some of the questions I have will probably come up. So why don't we just open it up for questions for each person. So the way we're going to use um, this um, evening is you're going to use your raise hand uh, feature, and I can see the order, and I'll just call out your name, uh, and you can ask your questions. Um, please be brief so that we can try to get through as many people as possible. If you're not, for whatever reason, and able to use the raise hand feature, um, you can drop your question um, in the chat box to me or just in general, uh, and I'll try to answer it or I'll uh, jump in to ask on your behalf. So let's see, I see Alyssa and Mackenzie. So Alyssa, why don't you go for it? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh. Okay, so hi, I guess I have a, a bit of a general question. Um, so I, 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 I have been to a, a couple meetings and I, I, I do hear a lot that sometimes you kind of have to keep applying and you're, you're really, you know, you're, you're just trying to make your application stronger um, and, you know, do better. So I guess my question is, what, what are you doing on the in-between, um, if, if that makes sense? Because, um, when you're like, you know, you're waiting for your application and for some people they've already graduated and they finished their undergrad. So how, I guess like the, some of the things I've considered is like AmeriCorps and FEMA and stuff like that. So yeah, like what, how do you sort of fill the space? Cause you know, there's still, you know, um, bills to pay and stuff like that. Like, are you just studying more or are you sort of finding employment elsewhere? Um, I, I understand that may be a too forward a question. Do you mean uh, at what point are you talking about when you're a fellow when you're a, uh, while you're in graduate school or bef before you so, start your interview at what point are you speaking of yeah so basically um when you're when you're applying sort of because I guess for example I'm a senior and I won't be able to apply until next year um so I I have to sort of find something on the in between before I can even get that far so yeah sort of like before you even get to the application process or like while you're in the middle of it, like, what are you doing? Got it. Um, I can take that question if, if, um, if no one else wants to, wants to jump in, is that okay? Go for it. Okay. So the first part of your question, um, I just want to flag, if you are a senior um, at senior level and you are going to graduate by May of 2022, you are um, eligible to apply for the Wrangell and Pickering Fellowship. That's something I wanted to know. But if you are like a rising senior or you, um, or if it's like a credit hours thing with your undergraduate institution, you know, just kind of, I, I would, you know, strongly 
just advice you kind of look just review the requirements again and see if you um, if it's possible for you to apply earlier or if you know if you or if you're wanting to just uh, wait a little bit longer that's fine as well now in regard to your question about the in between um, one of the best pieces of advice I ever received is that as you're applying for Wrangell and Pickering definitely look into job you know, job opportunities look into AmeriCorps and Corps and see what um, you know what your results are and then from there you can make a decision about what is a good fit for you and for your situation because a lot of you know a lot of folks they have um, they're trying to find employment or they have you know family matters or other you know situations um, that are that are involved as well and so that are unique to the applicant and so you um, can use the the data that comes to you to to make a decision you know in in that regard and something else that I want to point out um, all this fellowship has people from all sorts of backgrounds. So if you don't find something that's international affairs focused and it's in another field, don't, don't stress too much about it. I came into, um, the Pickering fellowship as a florist and I was able to translate my experiences into state department language. So, and that's where the 13 dimensions is going to come into, um, um, be very helpful tool for you as you craft your, um, essays and craft your other parts of your application. So don't, um, my best advice that I can give you is just to apply for everything and see what comes out and um, just keep trying and keep or uh, remain persistent. And then in the interim, also continue to do research and get as much updated information as you can about the Foreign Service. This is where the, your diplomat and residents in your region are of excellent, you know, an excellent tool. And then, of course, these info sessions. And I, um, you know, hope that um, helps answer your question. Thank you, Isabella. And just to clarify, because it also came up um, in the chat box to me. So uh, we only have the cycle for the Wrangle and Pickering session um, cycles happen once a year. So um, if you are graduating in December um, or graduating um, in a year from now, um, you uh, if you're graduating in December, you're certainly eligible to apply because you will have been done with graduate school um, or high, uh, undergrad. Uh, if you're graduating next December, you're you're a little ahead. Um, so you know if you're a junior right now, um, you know hold hold. You need to have gotten your degree uh, by the time you start orientation for um, both Wrangell and. Pickering. Um, and Alyssa uh, echoing Isabella, yes, get your work experience. If you haven't picked up a language, maybe start picking up some languages, um, build relationships with your mentors um, or folks who um, will be supporting you for the next application cycle. Um, if you can travel, certainly do so. Um, but uh, I encourage you to take a look also um, at on our website, we have the snapshots or the bios of all of our fellows. They've all done some amazing things. Um, so please do look there for inspiration on ways to fill up the time. All right, I oh, lost my, my little chat here. Um, I think it was Mackenzie next. Go for it. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, first of all, thank you for taking the time this evening uh, to wherever you are. I'm sure it's um, really late in Togo and Lesotho. So <laughs> thank you for, for doing that. Um, I guess my question for you all is, um, well, I have a two part question. <laughs> One is that how did you decide your cones? Uh, we have a variety of different cones here. Um, I have a variety of interests. <laughs> uh, so what sort of things, um, I have always been interested in PD, but also um, I work as a contractor now and I work on reports and political affairs in um, JTIP. So like, how, how do you decide? And at what point do you have to decide? Do you have to decide when you're entering um, or do you have a couple of years after your internships so you can kind of decide? And then my second part is you only have 600 words <laughs> in your essay. Uh, <laughs> um, and not to, uh, not to say I have lots of things I could share, but um, how did you decide what to sort of um, highlight and what do you think was most important in your, in your essays? Thank you. I can take a stab at both questions. Um, so the decision between uh, to decide on PD, it took me almost up until <laughs> starting A100, or actually, you have to announce when you take your FSOA, you have to list your cone of interest. And so 
I listed my cone of interest as PD and I was still, I was like 85% sure that I wanted to do PD, but grad school really did a doozy on me because I really loved the econ work that I was doing. So it was PD econ, PD econ. I was just like a, a mental boxing match. I talked to my mentor, I talked to my sponsor. The biggest thing that I did that helped me was, and it, and it ranges for different people, but I just wrote down what excites me about the work in each cone. Looked at, you know, examples. Could I call on examples, clear examples? And then talking to people, not just in PD and econ. One thing that I really want to emphasize, and I'm sure that my colleagues will share the sentiment, is that just because you pick a cone doesn't mean that you only work on that cone. We are all interconnected. The work that PD does is directly relevant to management, to consular, to econ, to political. So it's not as if you're only going to be working on political issues or PD issues. It's a, it's a true team effort. So, um, you know, I didn't unfortunately have the opportunity to do my overseas internship because of COVID, but I feel as if, if I had that <clears throat> if I had that exposure, I would have a better understanding, but I'm confident in the, in the decision of going PD because again, there is that sense and that beauty that Gabe or Gabriel just wrote in the chat of being generalist. Um, I can still work on econ issues, but through a public affairs lens. Um, I also had some inspiration because my previous work, I was in international education working with uh, ECA, which is Education and Cultural Affairs, um, a section of the Department of State. So I had a lot of great exposure to that since. So that's kind of the thought processes. So talking to as many people as possible is something that I would really encourage. And then just have like a, a heart to heart with yourself. What are you interested in? What excites you? And then it'll develop. In terms of your second question, um, Wait, what was your second question? I'm so sorry. <laughs> I have 600 words. 600 What's... words, yes. <laughs> Clearly I talk a lot, right? Um, so something that I did was uh, I had somebody who actually, this is gonna sound a little bit silly, but I had my grandmother. So, so pick somebody who doesn't know anything about what you're doing, read it to them or have them read it because you want eyes. It's great that like my boss could read my uh, statement that like my best friend could read my statement, but somebody who does not know what the foreign service is, what your interests are, ask them, did you under, could you tell me in 10 words or less, what is the core of my essay? If they couldn't, then I would start to edit. Um, edit it's, editing your own work is the hardest job. <laughs> and so uh, don't be afraid to um, have someone redline everything. Um, I did grant writing, I redlined everybody's work. And then when, it, when you get your essay back, you're like, oh, but it's all to um, help you get a strong message. Try to think about what is the core theme and then develop a story. Um, that helps deliver your 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 kind of like final word but i'll stop there over thank you all right um did any other fellow want to take a uh share some responses to that i was going to say uh, mackenzie we also have i think a video posted somewhere about personal statement writing so please do take a look at those uh, for some other tips um i see luiana and tima did I say it right, Luiana or Luiani? Oh, sorry, I lost connection there for a little bit. But yeah, it's Luani. Luani, um, yeah. go for it. <laughs> so hi everyone, and thank you for hosting this session. Um, I was wondering if one of these fellows would feel comfortable enough to share, you know, a time they were maybe going through academic hardship and they had to turn to the fellowship program or staff in some way for help. Is that academic hardship or? Yeah, academic, but if there's you know anything else during your master's experience that would apply, that would be helpful. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I can try to take a stab at this. Um, 
So in terms of academic hardship, uh, the fellowship provides a lot of resources um, and works with fellows individually, which is like keyword there, individually, um, in order to help you, you know, uh, be able to perform these, you know, a lot of these stipulations are they're they're a pretty hard set, but remember that there are people that are working behind the scenes, like Boomi, uh, who want to make sure that you get there. Um, so I cannot understate that enough. Uh, in terms of other items, I mean, again, the staff are incredibly supportive, um, particularly at Howard. Um, in addition to that, your university would also provide uh, some resources. Um, and you know every university is a little specific, um, but I was going through some personal hardship uh, while I was in grad school, and I went to uh, HU or Harvard University Health Services, and they put me in touch with a uh, with a uh, therapist, um, and that was all funded for through the university. Um, you know those those uh, 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 the 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 health service plan at my school was able to uh, provide for that and. I didn't have to pay a dime, um, which was pretty cool <laughs> um, for, for two years. Um, so so there, every university is a little different, um, but you will always have that core uh, fellowship staff who can provide assistance and help you uh, to connect with individuals because they are far more connected than you probably think that they are, especially at the universities that you're at. Um, and, uh, and then also the school is usually very, very uh, willing to help. Thanks for sharing. All right, Tima. Hi, everyone. Um, I just had some questions about like the graduate school application process. So I'm a senior and I'll be applying for this um, cycle of the Wrangell applications. And I, as a first gen grad student, I kind of feel overwhelmed by the whole process and like when you should start studying for the GRE, like prepping for grad school not knowing if like Wrangler Pickering is going to work out. So like what kind of timeline did you guys follow as you were um, applying for the fellowships? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that. I, I uh, switched rooms. I'm, I'm literally sitting next to my cable router. So hopefully it says my internet connection is still unstable. Can you guys hear me? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn my video off just in case because it the lighting's weird too. I don't I don't know how I feel about that, but I'm just gonna go video off. Anyways, um, okay. So to your question, it, it is very valid. You know, I, you know, as somebody who entered Peace Corps, I just finished my undergraduate program. Uh, my undergraduate experience was very weird. I went to two community colleges before I ended up transferring and, and finishing my my public administration degree. Um, the last thing on my mind was graduate school. I was like, I'm going to do Peace Corps and then I'll figure out what I'm going to do after. Maybe I'll get a federal government job, you know, who knows. But the last thing on my mind is graduate school. But then, you know, I did, you know, it was coming up to my two years in Peace Corps. And I was like, you know what, graduate school kind of sounds interesting. But yeah, I would be a first generation student, you know, student. No, no one in my family went to graduate school. So I was the same I was in the same place you are, um, you know, I was kind of feeling overwhelmed. I wasn't sure, um, you know, I, I was like, okay, maybe the GRE, that, that won't be too bad. But like, you know, just applying for all these different schools while at the same time applying for the Wrangell and Pickering fellowships, it was very overwhelming and being overseas and trying to do that um, was, was tough too, you know, um, it, it was just really difficult. I would say, one thing that helped me out is that if you know i know some of these graduate schools have early deadlines um if you're applying and you still don't know if you're a wrangle fellow or not you know tell them a, a lot of them on their applications will say um are you applying are you currently applying for any of these fellowships and then they'll list some of the most prestigious fellowships including wrangle and pickering so you can say that hey i'm currently applying to this fellowship and then if you become a finalist you can note that in your application or in your personal statement, right? And that'll catch the interest of the graduate school. I know for me, there was a couple of graduate schools um, where that was the case. I applied so early. I wasn't sure if I was a fellow at this point, but I knew I was a finalist. And so, um, you know, for the interviews. And so I, uh, I, I let them know on the application, hey, by the way, I'm a finalist for Wrangle and Pickering. Um, I'll know more about this, you know, if I, if I get the fellowship in about a month, 
And they were really appreciative of that. They're like, oh, wow, that's great to know. Let us know, you know, those are really prestigious fellowships. So um, I, I would say most of the applications that I filled out had a spot that you could say that you were currently applying for the fellowship. So I, I would mark that. And then in terms of, you know, the GRE, you know, I've seen a lot of grad schools are getting rid of the requirement. So, you know, double check, you know, every year it seems like there's another school getting rid of it. So, you know, check to see what the requirements are, what's up to date, you know, what, what schools are requiring and what they aren't requiring. I think COVID has kind of taught some of these schools that they can be a little bit um, more flexible with how they do their application process. So um, hopefully some of that helps. Thanks, Gabe. All right, um, we have Isabella and then Max. Hi, so I'm gonna reiterate, thank you everyone for holding this, and especially to the fellows who've come because I have a question that only you can answer really. So a big part of the fellowship, as I understand it, is you really bond with your cohort. And I'm curious, especially for Erica, because your cohort is currently out of school and you're all across the world probably, how close knit does it stay? And this pertains to our other, uh, the other fellows as well, but particularly several years out from grad school, how close do you guys get and remain? I can say for my cohort, again, it was a slightly different uh, environment when I entered. There were only 10 Wrangell fellows my year. We stayed pretty close. Uh, we follow one another. Um, I'm proud to say that I think eight of the 10 of us are still in the service. But even those that have departed, we keep in touch. Uh, we kind of know where one another are. Um, and you look for one another on promotion list. Uh, so it's a long journey. But the good thing is that not only your cohort, but your A100 classmates when you're entering the foreign service, and also depending on your pulse, you'll kind of just stay in touch. There's, there's um, uh, I'm still probably as close with colleagues that I've served with at various posts as I am with my cohort um, that I entered in with, just because you have those shared experiences over the two or three years that, it, that you're at a respective post. So lots of opportunities, I think, to um, bond, to be able to share best practices um, as you're in different jobs. Even now, I mentioned I'm a political economic chief in AF. I'm on a WhatsApp group with maybe 10 or 12 other AF um, polycon chiefs just so that we can share best practices and kind of keep one another on our toes. Um, and also just to be able to kind of share some of the struggles and hardships. So uh, I think there's lots of opportunities from that um, or to be able to, to develop close relationships that I've found throughout my career. Isabella, anyone else want to share on how you all are um, maintaining relationships, especially the uh, the newer, the older folks? I want older, but older in cohort uh, years. How you all are able to maintain? But I'm interested as well, considering COVID, um, we can't meet up with everybody like we used to uh, if you're in the DC area. So, Isabella, how about you? Well, we we also have WhatsApp groups, um, and we um, during the summer during the like the when we did like the internships we would have at weekly happy hours and play games or just catch up and and just kind of relax and so that's helped us um um not only to you know to interact and to keep up with what's going on with everyone but also to um you know just to share information and compare notes so that's been a very invaluable resource for all of us um, because it, it, it helps you to stay on your toes, but also anticipate what may be uh, coming next. And then, of course, when um, with COVID, uh, both both of the internships in my, um, well, well, no, one of the uh, internships in my cohort was uh, converted to virtual. And so we, we also were able to kind of, you know, talk about, you know, what the next steps were and comfort each other in some cases and, and, and just figure out what of what that was going to look like moving forward. Thank you, Isabella. All right, Max, go for it. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. Uh, thanks again for hosting such a great event. I'll try to keep it brief since we're nearing that 7 p.m. mark. Uh, so quick question. So grad schools arrive, you've already gotten one of the fellowships and you basically know that if all things go according to the plan, you will have a job at the State Department by the end of it. My question is, 
knowing that situation right when you all started graduate school, did you sort of have the idea that you should cater most of the courses that you should take, knowing that hmm, this skill or this area would be useful for what I should do at the State Department? Or did you take more of an approach of, well, this interest is like a secondary or tertiary interest of mine, but I would like to take the time to maybe take a look at it. And who knows, maybe one day I might have a posting that might have to do with this course content. Um, I can take this question. Um, well, for as far as um, selecting courses, I had three pieces of criteria. The first piece of criteria was meeting, uh, fulfilling the requirements for my program and making sure I hit those. Um, and that includes language requirements as well as the quantitative um, requirements as well. That was the first criteria. The second uh, criteria beyond that was taking classes I know that I would enjoy and absolutely love because when you enjoy your graduate school courses, then the probability of you getting receiving a good grade and receiving a high GPA every semester at the 3.2 mark is, is going to be a lot more, a lot higher. And beyond that, uh, one of the, um, one of the advantages of being, you know, a Wrangell fellow is that you know that you're going to have a job on the end so you can enjoy graduate school. And so that allows you to have a little bit more um, exploratory mindset than maybe some of your um, graduate school classmates may, may not, um, may not have because they're all, they're, they're like strategizing and figuring out those those next steps in a different you know in a different way, and so that's just a couple of things that you know that I want you to, uh, that that helped me when I was um, selecting courses. And I think that's such a great question. I'll, it would be great if I think the panel addressed their approach. Yeah, um, I just wanted to comment really quickly. So along or complementary to what Isabella just explained, uh, something that a mindset that I came into grad school and how I chose my grad school was not just, you know, like, was it a, a good program, but does it have good professors? Does it have good mentors? And so um, I found that when I was selecting classes, yes, like a lot of the times, depending on the grad, the program that you choose, your first semester is set for you because you've got to get in those requirements, even the first year. My first year, I didn't have time to do any of the electives because they stuffed my schedule the first two, three semesters. But what I did was I looked at the course calendar. I looked at the uh, professors who were having classes, let's say in the spring or in the fall, and I intentionally chose classes that had the hardest professors. So maybe not a great strategy, but they were hard because they were pushing us to do our best. That is what I sought in a graduate program. That's what I sought for a graduate degree. And I knew that I would have that experience with those professors. So, and I also went outside my comfort zone. My background professionally and academically is in Middle East and North Africa, as well as Sub-Saharan Africa. I did a uh, Pol political, economic, and security issues of East Asia, completely out of my cone. Um, but what I learned from that experience is that, and what you'll also learn within the foreign service is that just because you're posted in Tegucigalpa doesn't mean the lessons that you learn in Tegucigalpa aren't applicable elsewhere, because they are. Um, the security concerns uh, in Vietnam could be similar to that of Ghana, could be that similar to that of Peru. And so it's just really important. And I wanted to train myself to kind of have that mentality um, of, okay, this is a case study. What are the core features? Oh, there are parallels elsewhere. Um, that's kind of like the strategy that I had. And so far, um, I made it <laughs> like I graduated. So <laughs> there's, there's one benefit. And then secondly, I'm seeing now like, like in a most tangible way, working on Haiti specific issues that, oh, okay, this reminds me of X country or X region. So um, that's something to keep in mind. Yeah, just one one quick example on my end. I, I completely agree with what Isabella and Serlina said. Um, you gotta do something that that interests you um, and, and you wanna be challenged. You do not wanna coast by, right? This is the opportunity. You're getting paid to go to graduate school. I mean, you're, you're actually getting paid with the stipend and everything and, and with some of what the, the benefits that these partner schools offer, you are getting paid to learn. I mean, it's ridiculous um, in a good way, in a good way, in the, like the best way possible. It's like seriously so good. Um, and, and so for me, there was an opportunity one semester 
to take a course on writing for intelligence. Um, the LBJ School has a really big intelligence program. They actually have a, a CIA resident uh, officer who's there. So kind of, and it's the only school I think in the country that has that. Um, and so really big on intelligence. And so, you know, I'm not an intelligence officer, but the writing skills that you would learn in that class or, you know, anything that a political officer, an econ officer would, would love to have. So th that was an option. And I was like, oh, that'd be kind of cool. But at the same time, there was a class um, with a really renowned professor, a uh, history professor on grand strategy, where he just, he started with strategy books from Herodotus, went to Sun Tzu's The Art of War, War and Peace, Clausewitz, and just all these historical epic books that you're like, I'm not going to sit down and read a 1300 page book, but I'm in grad school. So yeah, I have two weeks to read it and I, I better get, I better get on it. Um, you know, it, I had the option between these two classes. And for me, yeah, the, the writing course might've been, you know, I might've learned more technical skills, but the foreign service is going to teach me to write, right? I have Bulgarian training now for my post. And then as soon as my Bulgarian training is done, I have um, political econ training where I'm going to learn how to write, how the foreign service wants me to. So this was my chance to get these foundational texts about strategy and war and military and grand strategy. Um, and I loved it. Oh my God, it was one of my favorite classes of all time. And I'm actually talking to that professor next week. Like we're just having a phone chat uh, to, to catch up. Um, it was just such a phenomenal class with, with an amazing instructor, amazing classmates, right? That kind of class attracts, you know, it, it, it brought in people I wanted to, to discuss the books with and, 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 and argue with and, and have all these discussions. So, um, you know, even now, a year later, that class is something that still impacts just the way I, I approach um, policy issues within the foreign service. So I would, yeah, I would heavily advise go for like what your heart tells you to and what's going to interest you the most. I'll let, I'll let Erica save the best for last. Um, so I, I came into grad school um, with a couple of goals, uh, one of which was a little bit more personal. Uh, I kind of already mentioned um, that, that I had uh, done some maybe extracurricular activities, if, if you will, in, in, in uh, self-help and therapy. Um, and, and so basically I would tell friends that I was looking to get a, a master's degree, but then also get an MA in me. Um, and so with that, uh, I would say, I will say that graduate school is what you make of it. And in that way, I'm echoing literally everybody else. Um, but what that meant for me was that sometimes I would take a course or maybe like take a smaller course load, say like uh, one semester in order to uh, do something else, like start a new club or uh, work on a hobby that was outside, like I actually interned at a scuba dive center um, while I was uh, living up in Boston. And so... And so like these, these are cool things that you could do during those two years that have been afforded to you because you know that you will be going into the foreign service later. Um, that being said, uh, before I found out that I had the fellowship um, and I was one of the, one of the last classes that uh, found out that they were going into graduate school before um, they found out that they got the fellowship. And so uh, I was basically looking at, uh, you know, uh, schools that had a little bit more hard skills, uh, international economics, econometrics, uh, statistics, uh, data realization. I was thinking, okay, if, if I, like I can study things that will for sure uh, make me uh, a tangible asset in the market if I don't get into the foreign service. Once I got the fellowship, I realized that I could actually study some things that were a little bit softer. Um, the negotiations coursework at uh, the Kennedy School uh, Often I had a I had a a, a lieutenant commander of uh, an 07 uh, naval officer um, say during one of our classes that this was the best uh, group therapy session he's ever sat on, sat on right and uh, and that kind of collaboration with those kinds of individuals in those classes allows you to interact with individuals at a deeper level. On top of that, I took courses that were well outside of the international relations framework that still had some applicability within foreign policy, uh, practically speaking, like nation building in native nations, right? Uh, in, in, in literally Native America. Um, and so that was, that was like a really interesting course. I took uh, religion courses um, on state and local politics. Um, and so, I mean, I really went outside of uh, my, you know, my domain uh, to to try to discern what a graduate program might look like to me. And in that way, I mean, 
you know, I'm not going to lie. There were several times in some of these courses where I sat there and thought, oh, if I could just like study one thing about like Eastern Europe on this, or if somebody could like make a comparison to some, you know, obscure protocol in, in Rio de Janeiro back in the 40s, uh, then that would make my day. And of course it didn't happen. Um, but that doesn't mean that there weren't examples uh, that were still incredibly applicable. And that might seem a little random, but were very helpful uh, for work activities later. I will be very quick. I agree with my colleagues. I pursued uh, the courses that I wanted to take that I was interested in. And I don't regret that decision. Um, I will say though, that looking at the time that I spent in the service, if I could go back to take any additional courses, not necessarily trading out any that I did, um, I would look at more courses in strategic business communications. I am an economic officer, as I mentioned, but um, even beyond the econ cone, the department has put a greater focus on something that Hayner mentioned, um, and, and that's data visualization. Whether or not I'm preparing a briefing paper for the secretary or just something for my office director, to be able to uh, quickly and concisely capture information, uh, make a persuasive argument in as concise a way as you can is something that is, I think, an important skill in the Foreign Service. You'll pick some of it up just by learning by doing, um, but the more that you can kind of get exposure to that and hone that in graduate school, I do think you find useful. Oh, great. Can you all hear me? Oh, you can hear me? Okay. Um, great advice. I love it. We could be here all day. Um, I hope we didn't get all through all the questions, um, but hopefully you got a glimpse of um, the various um, diverse ways of um, sort of tackling this graduate school piece. There's, there's, there's so much more we could have talked about, um, but um, each one of our panelists are um, phenomenal. And I wanna just make sure um, for the panelists, if you are open to being contacted, uh, you can drop your email in the chat box. Um, and uh, if you would like to reach out to them, uh, to any one of our panelists, um, please, please do so. Uh, uh, thank you, Zerlina, Isabella, Heine, Heiner, that was my New England accent that came out there. <laughs> Heiner, Erica, Gabe, uh, thanks so much um, for joining us this evening uh, from all around the world at that. And um, for the uh, participants this evening, um, the Foreign Service is a place where your life changes every two to three years and flexibility, um, quick learning is, is imperative. And each one of these individuals through their graduate school experience did just that. Um, so I encourage you all to reach out to them. If you, if you please attend more of our sessions that we've got coming up, you can check them out on the Wrangell and Pickering events page. And we will see you all or see your applications hopefully over the next couple of weeks. So thank you all so much. Have a great evening um, to our speakers. Um, stay safe, all of you stay safe wherever you are um, and take good care.